Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. My special guest this week, Phil Allen, veteran farm news analyst and pioneer of radio and television for the National Farmers Organization. Mr. Fred Deerdorf, who comes from Avaz, Missouri, and represents this state of Missouri on the National Board of Directors of NFO. In the field, a special interview with Charlie Barbet of Seneca Falls, New York. Fellows, Charlie Barbet of Seneca Falls, and I don't know whether either of you know him. Do you know him, Fred? No. How I don't about know you, him. Phil? Yes, I've heard of him. You've met him? He's from New York. Isn't he, he? Yes, he is. And he has inspired me this week to have a couple of old timers, like the two of you, on our show. Now, <laughs> may I just say this? Not old timers, Fred, in terms of years that is your age, but old-timers in terms of service to the National Farmers Organization. Charlie Barbet must be a man nearly 70 years old. He, uh, he's a fine man. He has been uh, an enthusiastic NFO worker and member for a number of years. <clears throat> so I thought, as long as we were going to have this special interview with Charlie from Seneca Falls, that it would be in order this week that uh, you, Phil, and you, Fred, would join me on the show to do a little reminiscing about NFO in the early days. Now, Very Phil, <clears throat> what about you? Uh, when did you first come to NFO? Do you recall? I recall very specifically that it was in August of 1955, but I'm not sure you could call it an NFO meeting. Uh -huh. The Des Moines Register was describing them as drought protest meeting. It was a season when there was a short corn crop in prospect because there had been dry weather during the late summer. But corn was going down, not up. And this violated the law of supply and demand. Mm -hmm. So with scarcely any publicity, uh, just in perhaps the local papers, a few handbills, Jay Lawfrey, who lived in Corning at that time, would call meetings in schoolhouses, sale barns. And in August of 55, I was sent here on an assignment because I was then doing some television commentaries for some local unions in the Sioux City area, Omaha, Albert Lee in Austin, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And I was sent here to cover one of these meetings. And I heard them talk about what to call the organization. They, said, they didn't even know at that time what, what it would be called. I huh? think that the letters NFO mm -hmm. and the, uh, the whole name had been thought of at other meetings, mm -hmm. but they discussed it. They said, well, let's have a title that's, that's simple, the simplest, most descriptive, declarative title you can get, national. Mm -hmm. At least at Farmers. that time, the, yes. uh, the baby hadn't been really officially named. That's correct. And uh, it was still in the stage where the press was covering it as a kind of a phenomenon. Yeah. There were several hundred at the meeting. And uh, there were reporters from everywhere there. And I was one of those who had been assigned to, to cover the meeting. Well, back in those days, what was it like, fellas? Well, as you'd, uh, as you'd come in the main one of the the main uh, storefront, and I think anyone who's seen a Main Street town will be able mm -hmm. to picture this. It seemed to me, anyone calling on the NFO would think, well, there are two people in the <laughs> full time. <laughs> Mrs. Doris Peterson, who was Orrin Lee's daily secretary, and yes, still is. Yes. And then right uh, behind where she sat in front of the opening the door, uh, the, the front door of the building, behind that was an office where Orrin Lee Staley was. And it seemed to me that the national board then consisting of seven or eight people from the states of this, I'm describing now perhaps 1957, mm -hmm. early 57. There were directors, I suppose, from Iowa and Missouri, and maybe one from Nebraska and one from Kansas. It was about like that. Yeah. And it seemed to me they were in session all the time. <laughs> well, now, Indiana, the state of Indiana, yes, come, in, come in there real early, too. Yes, it did. Well, wasn't Minnesota a pretty early state with NFO? One of the early ones, yes. Yeah. I think that as long as we're recalling those early days, Bill, it would be well to note the part that uh, former Governor Dan Turner played. I think so, too. I've heard this story, and I think that it's a good one. And incidentally, yes. Fred, I think that it was uh, Governor Dan Turner's family that actually occupied uh, a part of this building at the yes. time NFO took it over. Turner's Dry Goods. Yes. Or what this is, this, is, this is what I've heard, yes. Yeah. Yes, and he favored the NFO, and he sort of said, well, this building. Uh, and perhaps this had an influence in why the headquarters is located in, in Corning. Well, well I've been quite a guy. I've been present at several meetings where Governor Dan Turner was a uh, spokesman. Was he in 
inspiring oh, thought yes. I've heard he was. Yes, yes. Nice old gentleman. Yes, uh, he, he had his heart in it. Yeah. He was a farmer and a lawyer, and he was also governor of Iowa during the Great Depression of the 1930s. Uh, he maintained an active interest in farming, and he coped with the problems of the Depression. And I think this is why he was remembered uh, fondly after he had been a governor and was out of office. The people of Iowa respected him, both parties, uh, because he had dealt with the problems that came up. And his role in getting the NFO started was 20 years after he had been governor. You see, he was governor in the 30s. The first NFO meetings, called drought protest meetings, were in the 50s. That's a 20 year span. And what he said in those early meetings and, of course, you can see how, with his dynamic personality, the press would cover what he said. And literally, well, thousands would turn out to hear what old Governor Dan Turner was saying about the farm problem. They remembered he'd been sound uh, when the Depression was on. And what he was saying was, a government has had its time at bat. Farmers are going to have to help themselves. This is what he said. And uh, perhaps this might bring us to... Um, Another point in the story, Fred, what about farmers helping themselves? Well, I think this goes back to the convention that was held in St. Joe, Missouri in 1957. And a resolution came from the floor to point a committee, Ornley Staley was president at the time, for him to point a committee and for them to look into and see what was necessary for the farmers to come about collective bargaining as organized labor had. And I know this was a resolution that was on the floor from hour and a half to two hours, but it was finally okayed for this committee to be appointed. Uh, if my memory serves me right, Orrin Lee Staley and Lloyd Fairbanks went to Washington, D.C., and <clears throat> this is where they found the Capper's Volstead Act was already there. All we had to do was do what was necessary, put it in force, and go from there. But there was an awful lot of people talking about collective bargaining for farmers at that time. I think that's an interesting point that the resolution came from the floor, didn't it? Yes. And it was hotly debated, but it passed with a right. substantial... Right, Yes. I have some pictures here, uh, Fred. This shows an unfinished room with details like this. And then sitting along a bench here are people manning some telephones. Uh, who's this one? Well, I'm afraid that's me. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid it is, too. Fred, <laughs> that was a few years ago, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. Uh, you looked a bit younger then. I... Well, I'm still a young man. <laughs> Who would even talk otherwise? <laughs> Uh, but I think in these phone connections here and through our experience from working in holding actions and whatnot, this taught us that much more that we had to keep in contact with our people and also had to keep in contact with the processing industry also. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Here's another interesting detail about it. Well, I think we can go along here first and identify some of them. This one is Fred Deerdorf, and I believe this is Gene That's Potter. That's Gene Potter. And this is Vice President Singston. This right here is Bill Lashman. That's Bill Lashman. This is Orrin Lee, and I can't see enough of these two people to identify them. I can't either. There's another interesting thing about the picture, Fred. You notice here Orrin Lee Staley is sitting on a cot, and uh, this clearly illustrates the point about those early day holding actions that uh, this office, or Victory Center, as it was called, or, uh, well, any holding action. They manned these phones and this contact with the people 24 hours Right, long. right. Uh, let's take a look at some other pictures. This, I think, illustrates how the NFO, as the membership grew, uh, of course, the clerical problem grew. And here, you can see, is an unfinished office. No attempt here to decorate, but uh, definitely there's quite an addition of clerical help, and these are office girls sitting at, at modern office desks. Mm -hmm. Here's another one that I think illustrates the same point. Now, what's this, Fred? Well, this is heavy equipment of lifting desks. The doors wasn't large enough to take some of them through and lifting desks from the outside through the window. Now, this is in the upstairs office, which has now been 
made into a uh, boardroom after we got the corner building where we was talking about where the grocery store was. And, of course, we had the office girls up there for a while, and then when we got the first floor completed, then we moved the office staff down there, and these rooms up here are now used for a boardroom, uh, meetings, training rooms of bringing people in here and training them to go to work for different departments. As a matter of fact, you know, right up there where we're now looking uh, is our studio that we're sitting in uh, Yes, today. that's correct. This is part of it, yes. The fact of the matter is, uh, it looks to me like they could be putting that desk almost right into the studio. Yes, and this was the third of the buildings added to uh -huh. the complex on Corning's Main Street. Right. I think it might be well to describe the modern office of the NFO. There is a key punch department, uh, IBM, computerized, and there is very sophisticated modern Pitney Bowes equipment in the printing and mailing section. And what a printing and mailing section that is. They do so much work down there. Their volume of output is absolutely phenomenal. They do yes. an excellent job. It's a modern print shop in every respect. And, uh, well, from the early days when the NFO office seemed to be just a, a secretary and a, a back mm -hmm. office, it's, uh, it's expanded. I'd say that the uh, complement in the home office now is about 150 to 160 uh, people who do modern office work in, in every way. But there's still been no effort to make it expensive or to decorate it or to make it look impressive. It's utilitarian, Phil. Yes, and it's it also is. a small town. Yes, it really is all that. And uh, I think that uh, NFO would have it in no other way, really. I've heard them discuss this. Sometimes uh, people will come on tours to the home office and they'll say, why Corning? And they'll go through some of the same things. Small like town. At, but they will also point out that farmers are part of the economy of rural America. And uh, the NFO very deliberately didn't locate in one of the great cities. Uh, some farm organizations, Chicago, for example, or Denver. And the NFO has said, no, let's stay right where the rural... Where it started. Yes. You know, Phil, I introduced you as a veteran farm news analyst. And uh, I think this is most applicable to you. You have been a broadcaster all of your adult years. And uh, certainly no one else has pioneered radio and television for NFO uh, like you have pioneered it. Phil, in those early days, uh, broadcast was a bit meager, I presume, for NFO. You were riding the circuit, so to speak, but you weren't covering really too much territory in terms of uh, reaching the people. Not so today. What's the status quo? Well, I suppose we ought to mention that in those days while I traveled the circuit, I was also trying to do radio tapes. Uh -huh. Just a simple little audio tape that went to radio stations. Uh, since then, that's grown immensely. And I think that that's because uh, Butch Swain, the public relations director, and Don Mack, who actually spearheaded that, uh, stayed on the telephone and with letters and uh, contacts with our people and got the radio programs. So they're now heard on more than 500 stations and it's a coast-to-coast -coast operation. I can remember at one time I used to try to do 10-minute programs. I was doing a quarter hour one, largely dubbed off the television programs, to send to some little station in northern Minnesota. And I was on every day with that quarter hour. That about killed me <laughs> to try to do a quarter hour radio uh -huh. yeah. uh, in addition to the others. But since then, they've standardized the radio programs into three five-minuters per week. And they are renewed each week with new material. Mm -hmm. And they're duplicated with uh, processes that you understand very well in duplicating audio yes. tapes. Yes. Hundreds of copies. And sent out all over the country. And that's done from the home office here in Corning. Now, in addition to that, there's the operation that uh, you're a, a part of. Mm -hmm. You and the people in Kansas City uh, who come here and produce uh, U.S. Farm reports on film. And that goes to some 50 to 60 stations. It varies from a few weeks on the station to permanent schedule. And these are half-hour films. And I think it also should be mentioned that you won an award uh, for excellence for these half-hour films, right? Thank you for mentioning that, Phil. I appreciate it. And so now what we have really is a, a truly coast-to-coast -coast modern operation to get the NFO story out across to people. I think we've all worked hard enough on this week's show. Why don't we turn things over to our friend Charlie Barbet? All right. Fine. A delightful man, a real 
old timer in terms of service to NFO. So let's watch as I talk with Charlie at Seneca Falls, New York. Okay. Well, let's talk about you for a minute, Charlie, if you don't mind reminiscing with me for a few minutes. Not at all. Uh, you're a city fella turned farmer, which uh, I think is kind of a rare breed. Let's go back a number of years uh, to uh, the time that you were a young man. Uh, what sort of a, a career did you pursue? Well, I started out as an automobile mechanic. And uh, I worked for the uh, Cadillac company for a good many years. I became one of the uh, bosses up there in the shop. I ran the shop for them. And then after uh, five or six years, I went out and I uh, started out for myself. Mm -hmm. This and was in East Orange, New Jersey. This was in East Orange, New Jersey. Uh -huh. I started out, I had a garage there which uh, would accommodate about 100 automobiles. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had the garage, and I had it almost, uh, well, half to two-thirds paid for. I had the business and everything. And uh, so on account of the, the family, I took and I swapped the garage even for a farm. <laughs> so I, I went up on the farm. I didn't know anything about farming. <laughs> and uh, in fact, I didn't know the brisk, what the brisk was on the farm. And I took a short course in Rutgers College and uh, there, the uh, Professor Bender and Professor Bart were very good with me, and they, uh, they taught me a lot and gave me a lot of uh, information, and I studied beside the classes, and uh, within the four or five years, I, I was considered to be a pretty good farmer up there. Well, you turned into a pretty good dairy farmer, I understand. Pretty, pretty good, yeah. How big a herd uh, did you have, Charlie? Well, uh, I had down there about 105 to 110 cows. Mm -hmm. I raised some and mostly I bought. Well, it didn't take you very long as a farmer to realize that uh, the dire need for farmers to stay on the farm and to prosper uh, was price. And in fact, uh, you became active, did you not, in a, in a guild involving uh, dairy farmers in New York and New Jersey and Pennsylvania. I, I did. I, I was, uh, uh, they asked me if I wouldn't uh, go out and help and get the farmers in because uh, we needed a, a, an organization that, uh, whereby we could set a price. Uh, we were producing the milk, we were producing the product, and we felt that we should put a price on that milk, mm -hmm. not anyone else. So uh, I became uh, 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 caught, I, or I became one of the members, and I became a director, and I was assistant director uh, of the whole uh, organization. And uh, then it, uh, they went on a... Well, they failed. They wouldn't listen. They, we had a fellow there that wasn't, uh, he wouldn't listen to reason, and, and uh, the organization went to pot. But I held it together, and uh, then finally, we, uh, I talked to the boys, the directors that were in the organization. I said, we need a nationwide organization because they have expanded the order now, and they're going to go out, and they'll buy cheap milk, bring it in here, mix it with our class one milk, and I said, and we, we're, we're going we're to suffer. So I think the best thing for us to do is to look into some nationwide organization where we can help them to put a price on milk all over the country. There, therefore, that way we can, we can, we can uh, uh, get our price, we can stabilize the milk price, not only here, but help those fellows that are west where uh, they're producing a lot of milk, and uh, we'll all benefit by joining this big uh, nationwide organization. So uh, someone spoke of the NFO. So I looked into it and I heard that uh, they were in, at that time, I think 10 or 11 states and, uh, and they were going strong and uh, we heard a little bit about the program. So in order to get to know more of the program, uh, I called up Mr. Staley, the president of the uh, uh, National Farmers Organization, and he told us, he told me that if we were through that we didn't have any more connections with anyone else, that he would come out and talk and give us uh, the bylaws and the, uh, the or tell us all about the organization and tell us uh, how large it was and all that. Not in membership, because uh, that's one good thing they do. I never never disclose the, mem the n number of members. So he came out, and uh, I had a meeting in the Sussex High School, and I must have had between three and 400 farmers come out there I invited them from Pennsylvania, from southern Jersey, uh, from uh, northern New Jersey, and the southeastern part of New York. 
And as I say, we had about three to 400 farmers there. Mr. Staley got up and he spoke, and he spoke on the program, on the NFO program, and the farmers liked it very much. And then from then on, we, uh, uh, we had meetings after that. We had meetings in different parts of Orange County, Sullivan County, uh, Pennsylvania County. I can't think of the names right now, but uh, we had uh, meetings in all the counties in New Jersey and asked the farmers what they thought of the program. And they all seemed to like the program that the NFO had. And the most important thing they liked was because it was a nationwide organization. That was the thing that they liked very much. And they liked also that the NFO uh, gave them, gave each individual farmer, the, the right to vote on the cost of production because no other organization ever had the farmer come in and say, well, it cost me so much mm -hmm. to produce the milk. Never, mm -hmm. never got books or any uh, data on that at all. So they, they, that, they, they loved that part, and they loved the part of the program, and they loved the part that they, we were working under the Copper Volstead Act. Yeah. And from then on, uh, we, we had these meetings, and then uh, Mr. Swain, uh, he coaxed uh, us to come out to the convention. It was almost convention time, and uh, so we told Mr. Swain that <laughs> we had been running kind of low on funds, <laughs> and he said that to come out there that the uh, NFO would take care of that. So we did. We went out there. We attended the convention, and we talked to all those Western farmers out there, and uh, then we, uh, after we talked to the farmers, got all the information on at the convention, how they worked. We came back and reported to the different groups in New Jersey, New York, and eastern part of Pennsylvania, and they were all tickled with the program. They liked it so much, they said that, well, we should join. Well, in fact, before we went out there, they had already given me the okay that if they would accept us, that they would go along with us. Uh, we must have gotten the okay from maybe, uh, I would say, five or 600 farmers, that they would sign right up. And we did. We went out and we came back and we explained the whole thing to them. When we came back, we talked to those farmers and we had no time signing those, that group of fellows up. And then from then on, we went on to different farmers around. And uh, we, as, as, as Butch probably has sp talked to you about, that uh, they said that I signed a lot of farmers. Well, uh, a lot of fellows helped too. I didn't do it all. They all helped. They knew the program was good. They liked the program. And that's the reason we grew as fast as we did. Now, in New, York, in New Jersey there, when I was down there, we had, uh, well, I'd say we'd have between 60 and 75 percent of the milk signed up down there. That when we had the holding action, uh, we, we had the state all tied up. Charlie, I think you're too modest. Butch Swain tells me that you indeed are the one man who got things going in dairy in these eastern states and really got them going with a great deal of success. Let me ask you this. After so many thousands of dairymen signed up with NFO, through the years, what was their reaction? How did they feel about their affiliation in terms of what NFO has accomplished for them? Well, NFO has accomplished a lot for them out here because out here in the, uh, through the uh, federal order here, the uh, NFO, by raising the price out to the Western farmers, it brought their price up here because here, after they expanded the order, they, they would go out and buy the cheap milk and they'd bring it in here and mix it and sell it for grade A milk. And uh, that way there, they, they brought the, uh, the, the cheap milk in and, uh, and they, that cut our price down. And, and, uh, but when we got the NFO going and they started to raise that class three price out there, well, that brought our average class three price up here, and the farmers were all tickled because when you take the average of the two, when your class three price is your lowest, why that brings uh, quite a price for your milk out here, and yes. that that helped the farmers, and they appreciated that. And uh, that's one thing you ask the farmers today: uh, what did NFO do for you? Well, they sure raised the price for us. Yes. And then when after the hold in action, we also. Uh, immediately they, uh, they raised the price of milk 20 cents. We got that 20 cent raise here, and in about five or six months, we were paid for the total loss of the holding action. So the farmer didn't lose anything, he gained. He gained a, a, a prestige, and uh, he gained uh, uh, from the banker, he, he was a little bit better off because then the bank would uh, loan him a little more money, and uh, we, it, it did him an awful lot of good in every way. I don't care in which way your uh, values went up, your cows, 
uh, values went up. I, I could say it helped the farmer here. I wouldn't say 100%, but it helped them out an awful lot to the point where uh, there would have been a whole lot more farmers that would have gone out of business if it hadn't been for the NFO. Now, I can't say any more than that because that is the truth, and that's what would have happened. We, uh, we did have uh, 50, 51,000 farmers here uh, back in 1954, 55, in the order, order two. Uh, now we're down to 27,000 farmers. And I'm sure that if it hadn't been for the NFO raising the price where the, uh, where the most milk is produced here in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, why, uh, we, we, we would, would have been way down in, in, in farm numbers. Mm -hmm. We'd have been, uh, we wouldn't have had nowhere near the number of farmers left on the farm. Charlie, I want to thank you. You've been a delightful host to us uh, here in upstate New York. Uh, Charlie spent the day with us yesterday, uh, escorting us around this part of the country that he knows so well. Well, that's Charlie Barbet of Seneca Falls, New York. He's a rather unforgettable character, isn't he, Phil? I you, should say. You've met him, and you know. Well, you know, this has been a real pleasure, reminiscing about the old days with NFO, Fred with you, and you, Phil. Uh, indeed a pleasure, and I enjoyed your photographs, and uh, I think perhaps as a result of what you all have told me today, viewers of this show will have perhaps a better insight into what NFO is all about. Hope you'll both be back on the show soon. Well, we'll be glad to see you. Thank you. You bet. My special guests today on U.S. Farm Report have been Fred Deerdorf, who is a national director of NFO representing the state of Missouri, and veteran farm news analyst, the pioneer voice of the National Farmers Organization in radio and television, Phil Allen. Of course, we visited, too, with Charlie Barbet of Seneca Falls, New York. U.S. Farm Report is seen each week on this station at this same time. Until we meet again, so long, everybody. Mm -hmm.